hello there. Welcome back to another episode of I Love This, You Should Too, a podcast with me, Samantha Hees, and him, Indy Randawa. Hi, everyone. How are you, Indy? Pretty good. I thought you were going to give us like royal names to start. Like, oh. Me, your princess of Prosecco, Samantha Hees. <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah. Um, how are you doing today, Indy? Are you having a good time? I like to have a good time. <laughs> yeah. I'm... Uh, I have no good answers. I have sore triceps. How are you doing? I'm good. My triceps are not sore, but I am tired. So let's see how this podcast goes. Sick and tired? Just sick and tired of it all? No, just tired. Oh, I'm sick and tired. Oh, will you be okay? We'll see. You want to talk about it? It's going to come out. Oh, no. I'm going to start raging on everyone. (laughs) Oh, no. Well, if by chance you are new to this podcast, last week Samantha brought forth the movie The Young Victoria, something that I had never seen, but she claims she loved it. But when was the first time you'd seen it? Probably in 2009. And when was the most recent time before this week? Um, Maybe a couple months ago. Okay, so you know it's a good movie. I think you went to Calgary like at the in the winter last year, and I think I watched it. Right, because when I'm yeah. out of town, you watch princess and queen movies yeah yeah that's true and drink wine and just live a fancy life but you do those other things I when do. I'm, yeah you're right you're doing that right now <laughs> you currently are drinking wine i am drinking wine you don't have to pose they can see so indy yes we watched the young victoria this week we did i loved it did you not really okay i didn't hate it okay i didn't love it okay i'll take it <laughs> um, I feel like there's a good portion of the movie that's a little boring. Mm-hmm. There's a good portion of the movie that's a little confusing. And there's a good portion of the movie that is charming and well-performed. Okay. So you get a mix of all three of those. I think its weaknesses definitely lay within the script that didn't seem to have a real set concentration or direction. It was mm-hmm. kind of little vignettes of life over here and over there and sometimes we'd be going for one thing and then we'd kind of just forget about that i didn't like the time jumps that was one thing that i didn't like yeah if you were to ask like what is the main point of this movie what is the one thing that that they're focusing on it's hard to get an answer because a lot of it is just about her being young and about her first ascending to the throne Mm -hmm. but You could also make the argument that it's about her love with Albert, but that is such a small, that's a much smaller part of the movie than I'd anticipated. And I would have loved to have seen more of that because they're, they're fun to watch together. They are fun to watch together. They're very cute. Um, That's Emily Blunt and Rupert Friend. Rupert Friend. That's a good name. Is that how he pronounces it? I don't know. Actually, I'm not familiar with him. Oh, I assume that you'd know who he was. But yeah, I it's spelled friend like F-R-I-E-N-D. So sure. I'm assuming Rupert it's friend. friend. <laughs> that sounds like an imaginary friend that yeah. like a five-year-old has. Oh, this is my um, friend. His name is Rupert. Rupert Friend. <laughs> <laughs> he does sound... When you put it like that, he sounds like an imaginary character. Um... I really liked both of them. Um, I think last episode I had talked about how there was like a, a like a mini series, like made for TV version, kind of of this of Victoria's kind of ascension to the throne. And um, I've seen a couple little like YouTube clips. I haven't actually watched it, but it looks much more like um, like shows like Rain or any of those ones that are like really sexy. And so it's a lot more sexy. And this wasn't like a super sexy time period. There's a lot of a lot of coverage in those dresses and stuff. And it seems like this mini series that they did that wasn't the one that we watched was a little bit sexier and took a little bit more like a liberal approach to making it historically accurate. So I, I think we'll get into all of that about mm-hmm. this movie as well. But Queen Victoria is, although Victorian time period, you think the stodgiest, most buttoned up literally the most buttoned up because it's right yes, to their chin yeah but she like in her writings she talks about like albert's dick a lot doesn't she <laughs> yeah she's she does. like she's she like does. man you know what i love getting fucked <laughs> that's that's my queen victoria impression right there i like that yeah it's a little manly but you know <laughs> well you're thinking of emily blunt victoria not actual victoria who was more egg-shaped than emily blunt is <laughs> true and that's how she talked 
getting fucked. But she talked with a German accent. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to stop swearing now because it's making me uncomfortable. Is it? Just saying that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In relation to a historical figure? Oh, and it's not that part. Oh, okay. I don't care about her. Well, we introduced some things that we're definitely going to talk about. Mm-hmm. The historical accuracy, the portrayal of sex. But where do you want to start in this movie? I promise I won't bring it up if you give me like five minutes to talk about why I hate royal families in general. Do you want to do that off the top? No, let's do it at the end. Later? Let's not okay. taint anything. I can sure. get through all of this with just talking about it as a movie. Okay, I will give you five minutes to rant at the end. Because okay, cool. I am not blind about the fact that they have not always been very good. So They have not always been very good. That is true. And I won't say anything about that statement you just said until later. Thank you. Okay, so should we start by talking about um, Emily Blunt as Queen Victoria? Let's. I think that was definitely one of the strongest points of this movie. Mm-hmm. She's she's very good in it. She's so charming to watch. Like, she has such good, um, like, facial acting, and she did such a good job of seeming like she was from that time period that it was actually very believable. I think she was just good all around, and of course this has to be a reserved performance you're not going to be um nick caging it around and like going nuts right because you're playing queen victoria Mm -hmm. but i did feel like that's what i was missing not like cage rage but i felt like there was only one time where she was able to really show emotion and that was maybe one of my favorite scenes like Mm -hmm. um that one time where Sir John becomes physical with yes. her. Yes. Oh, that was one of my favorite scenes. And where she tells him off. And then when she turns to her mother and says, like, don't think I'll ever forget that you just stood by when while this happened. Mm-hmm. And when she was finally able to, like, it was like she was like a coiled snake this mm-hmm. whole movie. And when she was finally able to strike, you're like, yes, and you love it. And then you're waiting for something to happen again. And you just keep waiting and it just never comes. I agree. And I don't think that's a fault of hers. I think that's because there weren't a lot of real dramatic beats in this movie. Mm -hmm. There was that. And then there was one that never actually happened in the assassination attempt where Elbert gets shot. Mm -hmm. Those are about it. The rest of it is much more. And I guess you'd expect that of this movie. But everything else is much more reserved and played very internally and we Mm -hmm. don't get to see a lot of emotion from her yeah i agree and i think that's very much of the time period too i think this was more reserved and i think that women especially didn't show their emotions as much as maybe in earlier eras and later eras definitely um and i think that uh If there had been more moments, which I'm sure there were, because I'm sure behind closed doors and we don't get to see that because we weren't alive, you know, in the Victorian era. um, I think that behind closed doors, there would have been a lot more drama that we didn't see. And especially from someone who was about to ascend the throne and who grew up knowing that that's where she was going. Um, I loved that scene that you were talking about where Sir John, like, grabs her her arm and she flicks him away and you can tell that she's been trained all of her life to do this like to compose herself really quickly and not react in like a hysterical crazy way right but she defends herself and Mm -hmm. that was such a such a fun moment to watch and such a like empowering moment to watch i I really enjoyed seeing her stand up for herself because she's only 16 or 17 in that in that scene and she knows who she is and she knows where she's going and she really um like composes herself very professionally and i think that is the moment where i got on board with her character because up until that point it's kind of just like a poor little rich girl sort of thing yeah a little her bit. biggest complaints are like oh i'm so wealthy this place is so big and you're like well that's not so rough and you don't feel anything for the character because it is mm-hmm. it's a cold movie for the most part oh it is yeah and i'm not saying that necessarily as a negative thing but it's not it's about the royal family in the victorian era mm-hmm. it's not going to be really fiery mm-hmm. right that's just well they're not the tutors <laughs> but at that moment when she finally she breaks that royal facade and she becomes instantly relatable and she shows like a lot of strength of character mm-hmm. and that's the moment where it's like okay i'm on her side mm-hmm. right now so it was great to have that i felt like those moments were kind of few and far between. Mm -hmm. Like you could say there's the moment where Albert kind of makes some decisions without her and she takes Albert aside and they have that argument. And apparently they fought all the time. Really? Oh, yeah. 
So I had to do some research on this because I didn't know who any of the people were. And this movie is very dependent on that. It is. And you asked me quite a few times and you said while we were watching it, I don't think I could have like followed that movie no. if I hadn't have been there telling you who was who. Yeah. And we'll get to that in a moment too. But I just wanted to say like that was such a great moment that I wish there were more of those. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to invent Albert getting shot, which never happened, if you're going to invent something like that, couldn't you have invented like a handmaiden who was kind of on her side that she could confide, confide in and she could have some speeches that way? I'm sure there are actual ones. There were actual ones. Mm -hmm. So I would have liked to have seen her have someone to have that kind of internal monologue with. So we could see some of her emotions because they don't come out very often. And I know everyone's going to say, well, that's the time. But if you're going to invent things to make it a more cinematic experience, why not invent someone for her to talk to so we could get a little more insight into her life? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the reason that they went with that is because there were like multiple assassination attempts on her life in that very like spot. True, but... To have the prince be shot. Yeah, that's a They big, just made that up. That's a that big never liberty. Yeah, yeah, for Apparently sure. Apparently that guy who shot at them never had any bullets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his, his gun was just, just gun had powder. gunpowder and like yeah. cotton or something in it. And even if he had bullets and missed them, that is very different than having him get shot and play it as like, oh, he might die. Yeah. Yeah, I think they were just looking for like a speedy ending. If you're going to take that sort of liberty, there's so many more that mm -hmm. you could have taken because clearly they did their homework. And I'm sure like every gem and jewel and stitch on every article of clothing is 100% accurate. Mm -hmm. But then you'll do things like, well, let's just have him get shot or like, let's make uh, what was the prime minister's name again? Melbourne. Melbourne. Let's make Melbourne 40 years younger than he should be. Yes. Because Melbourne is 40 years older than the queen in real life. Yes. And they just like, yeah, we don't want that. They look like they're like maybe 10 years apart. Maybe if that. If Because it's like Paul Bettany. Yeah. And she's already older than what she's playing, which, you know, is going to happen. But if you're going to take so much pride in being so painstakingly accurate and then sell this, because everything I read about it is like, oh, it's so accurate. That's the best thing about it. Which, first of all, I don't know if just being accurate makes you good. And if you are, then why not extend it to everything? Like, if Kathy Bates was cast as Marilyn Monroe, people mm -hmm. would be angry. Right. But why can Emily Blunt be Queen Victoria? They don't look anything alike. Yeah. Why can you be cast with someone who's more traditionally good looking, but you can't go the other way? True. Very true. I mean, Hollywood, that's my yeah. answer, right? Like, I, I, I think that um, Emily Blunt, who is British and who probably has quite a good knowledge of that, would be like a really good fit to play some kind of royalty. And I think that that's what they were looking for was someone who where they didn't have to like worry about her butchering the accent or... But Queen Victoria didn't have a British accent. No, you're right. <laughs> she spoke 90% German. Yeah. Her and Albert just spoke in German and she had like a really harsh German accent. Yes. So if you're going to be accurate, like, they pick and choose. They do. And again, it's not, like, bad. It's not to the detriment of the movie. But I'm saying if you're going to make those things up, why not make something a little more exciting happen in the middle of the movie? Because there were some real big lulls, I found. Mm -hmm. There were some lulls. And I, I, can, I can agree to that, for sure. One other little thing I found out that was happening at the time, because you know all the business about how she wouldn't let any of the new prime minister's ladies be her ladies mm. in waiting. And that's a big, big plot point in this movie. Yes. So she effectively chose the prime minister in that because they couldn't form a government because she wouldn't any let any of the ladies in. Yes. Uh, I learned also that there was there was one of the ladies in waiting whose name I now forget, but her belly was starting to get big. And Victoria was like, She's pregnant. She's some sort of whore. I don't want her around here. And like bad mouthed her to everyone. Turns out the woman had a, a huge tumor and died oh of cancer. Oh my god! But that was like the one of the big reasons why all of that that whole thing happened. But they just kind of cut out the parts that make her look really bad and yeah. how that she essentially chose the prime minister, which is very undemocratic. Yes, they just make it like oh she just liked those people more, which is was not the case. Right. What was something about the movie that you didn't care for? I think, like you said, there were some lulls. And I think that they could have definitely 
not broken with like history like they did when Albert was shot. But I definitely think there were some, you know, salacious kind of scandalous things that I'm sure happened. And I'm not super well versed in the minute to minute history of Queen Victoria. Um, so I think that there were things that they could have included that would have kind of picked up the pace of the plot a little bit in some of the parts because it goes from the Sir John Conroy part where she stands up for herself and she kind of alienates her mother and then she then goes directly to fighting with Albert like an hour later. Yeah, the first part was interesting and I was Mm -hmm. into it. I was into like how she's going to get out from under the thumb of Sir John and like assert herself. But it just kind of happened. Mm -hmm. You had that one scene and that... We're both saying that was such a good scene. Why weren't there more of things like that? Yeah. After that one point, the king just says, like, okay, I choose you. And then everyone's like, all right, that's what we're doing now. Yeah, but but that's that that was monarchy, right? True. But why not put some stuff in there? True. True. Or have her conflicted about all this power, Mm -hmm. her worried about it, her excited about it. But you don't get that so much? No. Um... One of the things that I really liked at the beginning of the movie was that she says, and so I waited for my life to start. Right. So you do see her kind of jump into action as soon as the king dies. And as soon as she kind of exerts that power over Conroy and it, you see her suddenly start to like, everything falls into place for her because it seems like she's been planning this for a long time. She knows what she wants and she knows what's entitled to her and she knows how to how to comport herself to go and get what is rightfully hers. And I think that the filmmakers were kind of lazy in that sense because they could have showed a lot more fun stuff even. Like, like she has that one conversation with the woman who becomes mistress of the robes. Show some kind of fashion-y sequence. Show some kind of, like, girl talk sequence. Show something that's a little bit more fun and kind of breaks up the, like, calm boringness of the middle of the movie. Yeah, that statement of her that she was waiting for her life to start, I felt that because Mm -hmm. I was waiting for it to start too. Yeah. And if you think about this movie as being about the love story, that's really just the last third of the movie. And it comes so quick. It, this seems like it should have been a miniseries. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really fit into a movie the way it's put together. And if they were going to take a miniseries type of idea and put it into a movie, you'd think it would be all the exciting parts. Mm-hmm. But it seems like a summary of a miniseries almost. Like in the last third, we get... The marriage, the difficulties in their relationship, this assassination attempt, him almost dying, and then learning to compromise, and then an epilogue. That happens in about 20 minutes, I think. Yeah. And that could have been an entire movie, and that might have been... out over the movie. It might have been a better movie to just focus on one thing. By focusing on two, maybe three things, I felt like there was no real focus, and I think that was uh, a fault. I felt like I could have gotten rid of all the Melbourne stuff. Yeah. Or even just like had him be like kind of a peripheral character. Do the stuff with her mother at the beginning because that is very much who she is, right? Like it kind of sets the scene for how restrained and how um, like sheltered she is. And it really shows you how they're trying to keep her at Kensington um, to like keep her dumb, right? Like so that she can't gain the knowledge she needs to become the next in line for the throne to really like embrace her power and to be above them, right? Like I can't imagine how difficult it would be to be a mother who's a duchess and have a daughter who's a princess so your child who you gave birth to automatically outranks you yeah it's like child actors firing (laughs) their parents yeah um so i think that seeing that kind of like struggle and seeing a little bit more of the mother seeing less of melbourne and then bringing albert in sooner would have made this a more exciting interesting but still historically accurate movie I agree, because I think we get split between the political stuff, Mm -hmm. often centering on Melbourne. We get the Sir John and mother story, and we get the love story. And I think they do the best job with the love story, because that feels like there's some actual dramatic beats to it. But the other two just are kind of there. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I think that there were ways to make conflict in this that would have made the story better without having to do anything super dramatic or out of like the 
out of the historically accurate bubble that they've put these people in. Yes, definitely. I think just characters being able to speak their minds and having some more insight into those conflicts because mm-hmm. we, they're hinted at. But how they are presented, it seems it seems clunky. Like there's so many metaphors in this movie, but they're the most direct metaphors you'll ever gonna see Mm -hmm. like people speak in metaphors so you think like oh they're being dramatic or they're being elusive but no not really they're being very very obvious but doing it through metaphor for what for whatever reason Mm -hmm. like the whole bit about the the chess pieces which i think i talked about a little bit because it was in the trailer so we talked about it last week but everyone's like no yeah we get it and that is a very apt metaphor for what's going on but you can't be so direct if Mm -hmm. you're using a metaphor i don't know how it's possible but they speak metaphorically and it's more clear than if someone were to just go like i'm tired because they're just they're very yeah uh, and when people are being somewhat villainous or underhanded they have no levels of complexity to them like shakespeare villains are more complex than the ones we get here Mm -hmm. who are supposed to be real people But then again, Shakespeare probably writes people better than people actually are. So maybe that's not fair. (laughs) I don't think that's fair. I don't think the person who wrote this movie was Shakespeare. Well, that's true. (laughs) It's funny. I was talking a bit uh, episodes ago about the movie 42, Mm -hmm. which was a baseball movie about Jackie Robinson starring Chadwick Boseman, which... uh, Maybe can I just have one minute? Yeah, you can have one minute on Chadwick Boseman because I'm also very sad about that. Chadwick Boseman was not just a very important actor and performer uh, important and good he's mm-hmm. very he's, he's amazing but he was an important figure in not just the black community but for for so many people and black panther good movie some people love it i think it's pretty good but it's so much more important than a superhero movie normally is Mm -hmm. uh for so many kids they're dressing up for halloween and they're like i'm captain america and they're like you're not captain america you're chinese i'm daredevil you're not daredevil you're black you can't be those people and so many kids were able to dress as black panther for halloween and he he's he's very important and Mm -hmm. it's very sad that he's gone he played jackie robinson he played black panther he played james brown he played like so many icons of black culture and it's it i don't really care too often when celebrities pass because like oh i don't know them and i'm sad that i won't get to see their work but i don't take it too personally Mm -hmm. but that one yeah that one hurt when chadwick boseman died it's funny that we're talking about this today because i was helping set up a tv at work today with a soundbar and the first youtube video that came up was like a memorial to chadwick boseman and so we watched that and I was, like, kind of emotional, even though I was, like, stuck underneath a table, like, trying to plug something in for the tech. And it's, like, hearing all of these people talk about him and post videos and everyone from, like, the MCU was just, like, heartbroken. And seeing them post little things to their Instagram, and there was, like, a lot of social media coverage um, in this video. It was just... It was amazing to see the reach that he had, and it was amazing to hear from fans about, like, what he meant to them. Not just Black Panther, but, like, what he meant to them. Yeah, he was an important, Mm -hmm. important person in Hollywood, and we need more like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I derailed us, but I was talking (laughs) about um, uh, the movie 42 about Jackie Robinson, Mm -hmm. which is a great story. It's built in to be a great story. You have all of those elements there. And when it gets a kind of made-for-TV movie treatment that is very obvious, but almost talks down into its audience because of that, Mm -hmm. you're detracting from the story rather than adding to it. And I feel like just blatantly saying this is what this story is about, Mm -hmm. telling and not showing Mm -hmm. makes for a less enjoyable movie. And I think that this movie is guilty of that. Mm -hmm. And it's not like this is a bad movie. It's a good movie. It's a fine movie, but it missed out on being something that could have been quite a bit better. Yeah. And I think that this movie was very much made for people like me who are very familiar with like the British lineage and who enjoy watching pieces like this. Um, especially for the fashion, especially knowing the time period, I think that that is what this movie was made for. It was not 
it was not supposed to be, you know, some international acclaim kind of movie. I think it was very much meant to be for the fans and the fans mostly. That's definitely the case because I didn't know who so many of the people mm-hmm. were. Even some you didn't know either and you've seen it a couple of times. Yeah, right? there were a few that like minor people who I just didn't really understand who they were i definitely watch movies like this with my like wikipedia open and i'm like typing in names and stuff just to figure out where they are in the like history but and i don't think you should have to do that in a movie that's fair i think that that should be something that the screenwriter can incorporate if they can make these marvel movies when there's 24 of them and you can come into the 20th one and not really know anyone and you still can figure it out and you get the relationships without someone telling you like oh this person's bad you can just tell Mm -hmm. if they can do it i feel like this movie should be able to do it oh absolutely i agree i agree i i totally think that that is something that movies should be striving for like making sure that everyone knows who everyone is and i think maybe i'm being a little too harsh on this because in like those marvel movies you can tell relationships and you can mostly tell that like of course there's all of the the familiar relationships work which are very complicated even if you have a mm-hmm. family tree in front of you and definitely that doesn't come through if you don't know the people mm-hmm. but how they interact with each other is is very clear and at times painfully clear mm-hmm. it's so telegraphed how everyone feels about each other so maybe i should cut them slack and perhaps that's how they were coping with the idea that people don't know who mm-hmm. these other people are i think so i think it was kind of an attempt and a fail or slight fail right like just at trying to make it very accessible to the normal person but they also said like we have such a built-in fan base for like royalty movies that I think that even if we kind of hit and miss on that, we're still going to have a good fan base. Yeah, perhaps. Because it seems like they are trusting us to know who all of these people are, but Mm -hmm. not trusting us to have the emotional intelligence to understand the relationships, which I think should be flipped. I I was just going to say, I think that should be flipped because I'm going to say that 90% of the people who watch this movie at some point, because it's on Netflix, right? It's going to be one of those movies that you just turn on. But I think that 90% of the people who have watched this since it, maybe since it went on Netflix, for instance, aren't going to know who everyone is, but have a brain and are able to kind of decipher what true love or what conflict looks like on screen. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, so one thing I really wanted to touch on was the look of this movie and how this is one of my favorite parts about watching a period piece is the look and the costuming and how luxe and rich everything is. This is like back in the days when they had fabric on the walls and like, you know, as soon as a new person took over a house, they'd completely gut it and redo it in this like super elaborate, lustrous, like lustrous, amazing kind of opulence of the time. And I think that that is one of my most favorite parts about watching a movie like this. I think all those adjectives you use are very <laughs> appropriate for this. It is definitely a pleasing movie to watch. Mm-hmm. The attention to detail is clearly there. I'm sure the costume people were nominated for all sorts of awards and set deck and everything like that is great. I can't speak to the accuracy of it, but I imagine it is pretty spot on. But it is a beautiful movie to look at. I feel like the direction didn't add a whole lot to it, but maybe that's for the best. Maybe you don't want something super stylized in your direction when you have such beauty on screen mm-hmm. there the director here was just kind of allowing everything to uh, to speak for mm-hmm. itself absolutely so you mentioned awards um so they won two baftas one for best costume design oh, i bet they cleaned up at the baftas this is what the baftas are for royal yeah. royal movies <laughs> uh, so best costume design and best makeup and hair both of which were just like incredible i bet emily blunt got nominated as well didn't she, she? got nominated for a whole bunch of stuff um at list i will not read because that's but definitely boring <laughs> look it up um but they also won the uh 2010 academy award for costume design and i think that that is totally spot on i think that this was a movie that was absolutely deserving of that those awards because the costuming and the hair and the makeup and everything was just what really put you into the mood for this movie I I agree. Um, I think, yeah, it's definitely deserving of any sort of costuming 
award, but I do push back on that movies like this win Mm -hmm. those awards. And the more opulent and complex the costumes are, they give the awards rather than some things which are much more better designed, but not historical. Those types of movies don't often get any recognition, which is a shame. But that is a shame. Costume awards tend to go to historical dramas, Mm -hmm. but nothing to be taken away from this one because they did it very well. So they hired Martin Scorsese as a producer who apparently Martin Scorsese knows absolutely everything there is to know about like the British royal family and how to keep a film like that accurate. And then they also hired um, Alistair Bruce as a historical consultant. And I think that that really lent itself and really showed itself through the costumes and like the design of the movie. It still surprises me that Scorsese is such a... A royal family guy. Yeah. But I also wonder if he actually saw the set at all, because producers don't... It depends, right? A producer could be someone who comes on to the movie after it was mm -hmm. filmed and edited, but he was brought on... It sounds like he was brought on because he's known in, like, the producer film, like, circuit. Circuit? Is it a circuit? Sure, it's a circuit. In the producer film circuit that um, he is known for knowing a lot about British history and he's kind of the guy you want for authenticity, Hmm. which is surprising knowing like his other movies. But um, I think that's so cool when somebody has a niche and they get to work on kind of a passion project. Right. And they get to do something that they like actually have a lot of knowledge about. Um, I want to see him direct a royal family movie. If Scorsese had directed this movie, it would have been awesome. Agreed. Agreed. So Indy, do you have any favorite moments of the movie where you were just like completely in awe of either the set or the costumes or the makeup or the hair or anything like that? Not as much because I'm sure there were great depictions of the interiors and things but a lot of them blend together for Mm -hmm. me. Uh, Some of the garden stuff was was very cool because I think the closest thing I've been to is like walking around the gardens of of Versailles and that look that reminded me of that a lot. Mm Mm-hmm. There was the one big dinner where the king did his big shaming speech. Oh, yeah, because he was mad at her mother. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. uh, that dinner looked great. I kept commenting on how much rack focus there was yes, in that. Yes, yeah, like the, the wine glasses all the way down the table and that kind of thing. And I think that was to emulate how drunk he was, maybe? The rack focus on the wine glasses was not, because that is very much a thing that is still, like, it's it's historically accurate, and it's also still currently accurate. And rack the fact focusing? that. No, the the focus on the wine glasses and the precision and like oh, no, how yeah. all of that. But yeah. I think because it had such shallow depth of field and how the focus was so shallow and changing all over the place, I think it was meant to be about him being drunk. I think drunk and sick. Yeah. Because he died shortly after that, right? Like I think he was struggling with a lot of health issues that were probably exacerbated by the amount of alcohol that people consumed at his parties. What was your favorite beautiful scene probably the ballroom at her coronation it was so gold and beautiful and happy and her and albert finally get to like share a moment together where she's kind of in charge and it's beautiful and i i really loved her whole outfit and their banter and their dancing and everything and he's learned the waltz for her like i felt like that was so romantic have you ever seen the kenneth branagh hamlet no you might like that for some of the the same things. It's hmm. a it's a beautiful movie. I was lucky enough to see a seventy millimeter presentation of it once, and it's it's a gorgeous movie. Huh. Maybe we'll eventually do that because I, I love Hamlet, and I think the Brown one is is pretty solid. That's... Although he's too old, but still. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's definitely one of my favorites, but also all of the scenes kind of, uh, like you said, in the garden, but also in, um, Kensington Palace, the, the palace where she grew up. Um, and I think that that was so well done because this was a woman who was trying to raise a daughter and all of the funds in the family were going to the daughter because she outranked her. She had more income coming in and i think that the the coldness and the darkness of that house really kind of started off the movie in a really good direction so i feel like one of the final things we need to talk about for sure is the love story between albert and victoria this is something that is talked about still when you talk about queen victoria 
the queen that we all see in her portraits wearing black. She was so in love with him that when he died of typhoid at um, a very young age. In his 40s. Like in 42 his 40s. 42, yeah. Um, it, it broke her to the point where she still laid out his clothes every morning of her reign. And she was one of the longest reigning monarchs. So she reigned another 40 years almost. Yeah, because um, she lived to her 80s, I yes, believe. Right? Yeah, she was the longest reigning monarch until our current Queen Elizabeth II. Don't say our current. Okay. She's not my queen. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the current reigning monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, who is now um, the longest reigning monarch in British history. So I think that... Um, the image that we see of Queen Victoria is of her in black, buttoned up to the chin, very large and plump. We don't get to see this side of her, and that was one thing that I really loved about this movie, was that you got to see the young, idealistic, romantic side of her that you don't get later in the later part of her reign. Yeah, I liked seeing this part. It was it was the strongest part of the movie, I'd mm-hmm. say, because we got more emotion from her or more insight into her character because you get those moments of strength which looking back on it now maybe I'm being too critical because I kept saying like I wanted moments where she was going to show her strength I'm not just young I'm not just a woman I know what I'm doing and I know what I want and we did get those but mm-hmm. maybe I just found them underwhelming I guess maybe there I feel like they one, could have been stronger there was that one that we talked about that mm-hmm. was very good I think it falls on to the writer then mm-hmm. that if that's built into her character that you have this person who's so little is expected of her, but so much in a very different way. And then she rises to the occasion. That's has so many built in moments that I don't feel were were utilized properly. But I think where uh, the writing had a chance to shine a little bit more was in the relationship with Albert. Mm-hmm. The courtship was kind of unfulfilling in mm-hmm. a way because it was accurate, which is not the most dramatic because it's taking place over letters it's taking place in denmark and england oh was it denmark it was denmark he was yeah oh i didn't realize that he's danish yeah Yeah. i thought he was german or austrian huh maybe he was austrian i I don't know um okay so he was from uh the ernestine duchies which is in present-day germany okay yeah uh but i did like how you would get to see him struggling over these letters and what to write and him because he was also sent on like a marriage of convenience. He mm-hmm. was sent there to kind of consolidate power. It was political. Yeah. But he truly did fall in love with her. And I felt his journey had more to it because of that. And mm-hmm. that was fun to see. And him struggling over those letters and then deciding to send the music. Like I liked the little bits mm-hmm. like that. But there weren't that many of them for it to be like a real love story. And then on her end, you just kind of have her going like, oh, yeah, okay. She didn't really have that turn. Like, was there something in it that made her go away from other suitors to to Albert? I think that the fact that she had so many suitors being pressed upon her and she found some common ground with Albert, that's why she decided that she loved him. Mm -hmm. Um, She was supposed to, you see, um, when they go to, when her and her mother go to court for the king's birthday, um, you see there's like this really background redheaded guy. Um, who they kept saying, oh, you and your cousin, oh, you and your cousin. So that was the man that she was supposed to marry was her cousin. Wasn't he also a cousin, though? Albert? Albert was technically a cousin, yes, but this was a very direct cousin. Sure. Um, And I think that she objected to him because she'd known him all her life and was not interested. And I think that Albert was new and exciting and someone that she hadn't met before and someone that she had found some common ground with and decided that, yes, I could see myself sharing my power life with this person. Yeah, he made that great chess speech. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed the chess speech. (laughs) But if there are those other people, there's probably dozens Mm -hmm. Of potential suitors and so many more who would love to be in that position. But if there are all those other people, why not show that a bit more? Mm -hmm. And then the turn of her choosing this guy who was maybe you play him up as a bit of an underdog, but then she finds him charming because they do have those differences and he's willing to to say that he doesn't agree with everything that she does. 
And then we appreciate her strength of character all the more because she's willing to choose someone who challenges and supports her rather than mm-hmm. someone who's sycophantic. Right. Which I think is underlying it, but I don't think it's nearly as present as it could or should have been. I think they could have played that up for sure. Um, You kind of see it at her coronation ball because she was unmarried and unattached and unengaged during um her coronation. So she ascended the throne as like a single woman and that was like one of the first times that it ever happened. And I think that that is like great to see and then at her coronation ball you see all of these like princes after um so who it was the prince of prussia that's who it was um and she like makes a joke about oh my poor little toes i feel bad for them already oh, yes, yeah. right like that so i'm sure that evening and i'm sure we could have seen more of that in this movie of her like not taking anyone seriously because I'm sure she's been paraded in front of these people all of her life. And I think Albert is the first person to take her seriously and to like really respect her power and her position and understand how he would fit into that equation. And I think maybe we're meant to get a bit of that with the Melbourne character, Mm -hmm. that there's some sort of romantic interest there. I would have just cut that out Mm -hmm. altogether. You have your first act being about her getting away from under her mother and Sir John's thumb. And then in the middle, you have all of these different suitors and she's fed up with it. And we start bringing in the Albert character who Mm -hmm. is like a breath of fresh air and who's someone who's willing to speak his mind. And that's what she values because that's who she is. And then you have the love story and it could even end with the wedding. And that's a good movie. Mm -hmm. Or you start Albert much earlier and then you get to see them through the years. You get to see some tumultuous times. But then we learn that over it all, though, they always come back to each other. But all of that is wrapped up in a few minutes at the end of the movie, which is it's kind of unfilling. It is. It is. And I think that we could have cut Melbourne out. Like, I totally agree with you. I think Melbourne could have been a side character and could have very much been... 15 minutes of this movie or not at all if you're not going to get into the full story about Mm -hmm. it why include it at all true very true and i think that we could have brought albert up like you said much earlier and i think that that would have made this movie the full romance that it could have been yeah and especially at those times when they're changing letters that's a bit of a lull in a lot of ways and if during those moments She's being bombarded by all of these other guys who we as audience members want to root against because they're presented in a more negative light. Mm -hmm. And then he's finally fed up and then comes over there. Like that moment when he walks in with his two dogs, that'd be so much better under those circumstances yeah, than how it was because it, it would seem like it was a slow build to it right? yeah or like he's coming to rescue things right because mm-hmm. she's under attack from all these other people yeah and... i agree with you yeah i just think the script needed help mm-hmm. and i'm the one to help him <laughs> hire me i will hire you <laughs> i still love this movie i think it It's kind of almost in the guilty pleasure kind of realm. I really love the opulence and the visuals of these kinds of movies. And I love the historical parts of it as well, even though this one maybe didn't match up quite as historically as it should have. But I think that I love this kind of movie just for the escapism of it. Interesting, because I wouldn't put this into that guilty pleasure category it's almost like a character study more than Mm -hmm. anything it's about victoria and it's trying to capture a character who is reserved in so many ways but then has all of these really unusual and high stakes scenarios happening to her and that could be a very good movie but it never felt fully intimate to that character Mm -hmm. and I don't even have like a quick answer of how they could have made that. But if you're making this a character study, which I think that's probably closest to what this could be, you need to get more out of that character. And it's not uh, anything to say about Emily Blunt's performance. I just don't think she had those opportunities. Right. Instead, it was written as a period piece above all else and a love story second and kind of a political story. And all of those different influences work to kind of muddle it. Mm Mm-hmm. And at the end, you still don't get a complete picture of this character. Okay. So I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's a guilty pleasure. I just think it's a bit of a missed opportunity. Okay. That's fair. I I appreciate hearing that from you because you're obviously someone who knows how films are made and... 
A little bit, but it shouldn't, it's not even that. I think if people watch this movie and they're not fans already and they don't know the story already, they'll be like, huh. And that's it. I think that's your reaction to this movie. Like, yeah, that was fine. It was slow at some points, but it was lighter than you would think this movie would be. Mm -hmm. It does flow at some points, but it gets bogged down at some Mm -hmm. points and it's slow to start. Absolutely. But it's ultimately light. It's not like a really heavy, hard watch. It's like an hour 40, something like that. It goes by pretty quickly, even though I am saying that it felt like some parts could have been (laughs) not cut out. I don't want it to be shorter, but I want more to happen within that time a little bit. Right. I understand. I totally get that. I think that this movie would have been served way better if it had had a different writer and if they had punched it up a little bit historically and really put in the good stuff. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know if that's the... Or just explored what they already had yeah. a little more. Yeah, I mean, rather like, than good f- stuff in spreading its focus so yeah. wide. Because at the beginning, it's all about, um, well, she's 18 and she's sheltered. She shouldn't be running the country, which is fair. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say that's pretty fair. Yeah. If someone's lived in one home their entire life, never really left it, never walked up a staircase before without holding someone's hand. Yeah. And they're 17... You know what? I I don't think they should be running a country. I think that's fair. And her uncle was passed over for it. And like that guy was, what, like 50 and a war hero and stuff. And he's just like, what about me? Yeah. But True. So it's weird to be on the side of the villains of the movie. Of like, Yeah, I think she did need a little help. That's probably a good idea. Mm-hmm. The beginning of the movie plays it up about how sheltered she is. That's a big part of the story. But then she also goes like, oh, we're luckier than most because we live here. Well, how does she know that? They play it both as she's sheltered and that's what's holding her back. And also, she knows these little insights into how the poor of England live. Yeah. Which doesn't make any sense. No, I would probably bet that she had no idea what the poor of England did. And they make a lot of points of how she's going to like do things for the poor. I don't know. I don't, I don't know her biography or anything but i do know a little bit about victorian england and if she was doing things for the poor it didn't work very well Mm -hmm. because it wasn't great there that's probably Mm -hmm. one of the worst times for the for the poor yeah but they make a point of mentioning it and i think if you make a point of mentioning it then you're opening yourself up to criticism about like yeah that's that's not true and then i could just start criticizing about all the other terrible things that she's done okay because they brought it up about how she's like great and has insight into the poor of England. (laughs) Okay, well, let's finish up talking about the movie and then you can go on your little royal rant. (laughs) Okay. Um, But at one point, is she magic? No. Did she fly in this movie or at least float? No, I think it was supposed to illustrate the fact that she wanted to be with Albert so badly that it felt like she didn't even have to have us together. Fair, if that ever happened in any other way throughout the rest of the movie. Mm-hmm. But there's one shot and one shot only where she floats. Mm-hmm. That You can't do that. No, it was weird. You're right. It was weird. And I love little bits of magical realism. But you can't have one. If you have one, then it's like, was that a dream? Did that rest <laughs> of the scene not take place? I think that night was supposed to be a dream. Like a literal dream? No, that it never happened? like it was supposed to be like... As good as she expected it to be, I think. But then you have other things to, like, back that up. When you have one element like that, it's very strange. Mm -hmm. What if we're watching Gone with the Wind, and then there's one scene, there's a dragon. (laughs) And then everybody's like, hey, what was about that dragon? They're like, oh, no, it was, like, meant to be how fierce she was. And you're like, okay, then why wasn't there any any other moment? (laughs) Okay, you know, you're right. It's just strange. Flying is not appropriate in this movie. But it was one of the best shots of the movie. It was. It looked great. It was bizarre, though. It was bizarre. But it was that whole scene with the dance and the ball and everything was just gorgeous. So, Indy, I know that you've been really holding back for my benefit because I (laughs) really enjoy this whole time period and these people. But uh, you said you had some things to say about the royal family. Yes, you're contractually obligated to let me vent for a little bit because I was mostly good and never brought up genocide once this whole time. 
Okay, you have six minutes. Go. Six minutes? Oh, I can do it in six minutes. No problem. <laughs> I think I might have said on the last episode that the only good thing about the royal family is that they give women good roles to play because mm-hmm. there's not a lot of great roles for yeah. women written. True. But then you get queens and then you can get older women finally playing things too, with people that we don't get to see a lot. Uh-huh. So that's the good thing. But I just don't get the fascination and the unequivocal love people have for royal families in general. Like, I can more understand why the British or even Canadians have a love for the British royal family because there's something culturally ingrained into that. Mm -hmm. But just the idea about, oh, you have to treat someone like a princess. You're my queen. You're my king. Why is that always the Mm go-to? Why is being rich and powerful but having done nothing to get there seen as such a great thing? Mm -hmm. Because royals are the people more than anyone in the world who did nothing to get their power. Mm-hmm. You just had to be born. Sometimes you had to murder your own brother to do it, but that's about the only <laughs> thing you have to do. You've done nothing. You don't deserve it in any way, unless you believe in like divine rights still. Anointed by God, yeah. So is that what you think? That no. they are just better no, humans than us? I don't. I don't. But that's kind of the thinking behind it, that they're somehow better. Mm-hmm. I don't know why that we're in a time now where we can tear down statues of slave traders, of our first prime minister because of terrible things that they did or had some sort of involvement in. But all the royals were like, no, you can't do anything to them. They're cool. They didn't do anything, but they were the worst. They did so many bad things that I just don't understand. And you can explain it to me about why is it just better? Why is everything royal better than everything else? Oh, I'm not getting into this. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm trying to understand. No, I know. I think um, before for government and like democracy was a thing it was very much like you needed to have some kind of head of power um but i think that it's definitely something that is kind of an aged institution and now really like queen elizabeth ii is a more of a figurehead and a constitutional monarchy and she's not as important as she once was or her family once was. True, but if she chose to, and I'm not saying anything against her specifically, but if she wanted to, she could come here and kill you and it would be okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In Canada, the queen is allowed to change any law at any time. Why? (laughs) And I don't like that me saying this is silly or controversial. Mm -hmm. Why should we let someone have that kind of power? Why are we Canadians sending money to these super wealthy landowners? Mm -hmm. There's no reason for that. I mean, I have no answer. I I think I have a very, like, romanticized love of the British monarchy, and I love the history of it. So I kind of, like, I think I kind of accept it just based on the fact that, like, it's a story like historical institution but i agree with you i don't think that they should have the power that they do and i think that you know if they choose to live like they do and just be kind of political lists not even figureheads but just you know public figures then that's fine it's no different than a celebrity or whatever but i think that there is definitely no longer a place for them in modern institution I hate a lot of... I hate the idea of celebrity, Mm -hmm. really. I hate uh, Vin Diesel. But people choose to give their money to Vin Diesel. I don't know why you do, but people keep seeing his movies. Although those late Fast and the Furious ones, when The Rock gets there, they're kind of funny. (laughs) But anyways... Haven't seen them yet. (laughs) They're choosing to do that. Mm -hmm. But the government, who is a democracy, Mm -hmm. we would think, takes our money and gives it to them. Mm -hmm. And they... Most of their stuff is all stolen anyway. Queen Victoria, while she was queen, about 30 million Indians died Mm -hmm. because of British policies. They took all the food, took it Mm -hmm. to England. All of the Indian people, yeah, they just died. Uh, They estimate at that time they took about $45 trillion worth of goods and things from India while all those people starved to death. Then you can say, well, she's the queen. She's not the prime minister. But she chose the prime minister. Mm -hmm. She literally changed who the prime minister was. And do you think if they said like, hey, uh, stop the genocide, people would listen? She didn't. Uh, The Great Hunger, sometimes called the Potato Famine, that Mm -hmm. was during her as well. 
because at that time they took all the land from the Irish and they gave it to the British, but they still had Irish people farming it and they took what they wanted. And then there was plant disease. Also, there was no um, landlord system. So there was no one looking out for it because all the money was just going to England. Uh, A million people there died. A million others left Ireland because to avoid the famine and the queen. But then she's like, I'm going to do something because these are at least white people. So I'll give them 2,000 pounds, which at the time is, is money. That's a lot of money. Uh, not going to save a million lives. But then the other side effect of that is no one could look more generous than the queen. So like mm-hmm. the Turkish government was like, here's 10,000 pounds. And the British government was like, no, no, you can't give them more than the queen. <laughs> so they had to return all the money and just uh, just starve. And uh, there's there's more. There's a lot of genocide. Either, mm-hmm. What I'm saying is she's in power. Millions died mm-hmm. around the world. And you can look this up very easily about, well, just like any monarchy. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they just, they kill lots of people and they don't know who they're killing and they just get wealthy off of it and they're wealthy off of it still today. But you got to treat your girl like a queen, man. (laughs) So to treat you like a queen, I am going to, um, I don't know, murder people who have darker skin than I have and, uh, give their money to you. No, I guess. you can just make me fish tacos tonight, okay? That I will do. That's something that queens don't get. Fish tacos? I don't think so. You oh. think Queen Victoria ever had fish tacos? You think Queen Elizabeth ever had fish tacos? No, she doesn't like garlic, so. She doesn't like garlic? Queen Elizabeth II. That's there's, the most British thing I've ever there's heard. There's no garlic in Buckingham Palace at all. Oh, she just eats like boiled <laughs> toast is Queen Elizabeth's favorite food. Okay, well, shall we wrap up this episode on the young Victoria? I guess I did have um, like nine pages of more stuff of what Queen Victoria did to murder people. How were you going to fit that into six minutes? I got distracted. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, let's wrap up this episode. People can find her crimes on the internet. And And don't give me that like, oh, well, she had Abdul with her that like she had like a brown guy hang around with her. And then they made a whole movie about it. Like, look, she's progressive. It was like having a dog the way it was. Yeah. And also... I have read about that and I haven't seen the movie, but... You can't, like, kill someone's family and be like, oh, but I'm going to let you stay in this nice building, so it's cool, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, The Young Victoria. Yes, the movie, not the person. The movie, not the person. Um, I did ask you to kind of suspend your knowledge of the monarchy um, in order to watch this for kind of the love story and the beautifulness of it. Indy, you said you didn't really like it. Did you change your mind at all? It's not like I dislike it, mm-hmm. but no, I don't love it. It's it's a fine movie. It's an okay movie. If you are a fan of period pieces and you like looking at set deck and costuming, you'll love this movie. Mm-hmm. If you are a fan of the British royal family, this is a period where we don't get to see as many movies, or at least of this type, mm-hmm. focusing on on this story. You'll probably like it for that. But if you're just coming to it for a movie, to see a political movie, to see a love story, I think you're going to be disappointed in both of those because it doesn't really commit to either type of story. And I think that's to its detriment. And you can say that like movies should be able to transcend their subject matter. Good mm-hmm. movies, great movies should mm-hmm. be able to. You don't have to like baseball to like A League of Their Own. Mm-hmm. I think it's a good enough movie that it transcends that. You don't have to like sci-fi to like Star Wars, at least the first three. I think mm-hmm. they're bigger than that. You don't have to like vampire movies to love Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So it's just good. It's good as media, as television, as movies. All those things are are just good. I think you do have to love royal families or movies of this type to love this movie. Although I think it's very capably directed, beautifully shot, well performed, I don't think there's anything in it to make it transcend its genre. Mm -hmm. I think it just is an example of that genre and not something that is going to bring people from outside of liking that type of movie to like this one. Hmm. Okay. It's a good movie. It's a fine movie. It's not a great movie. Where do you end up on it? You loved it before. We talked about it. And you agreed with a lot of the negative things I was saying. And because of that, I feel like we didn't spend enough time on the positive things. But I still love it. I still love it. I still love it. Like I said, it really fits. It fits a moment and a feeling that I'll get. And I'll want to watch a movie like this. And I think that it it totally fits. And it works for me in that moment. And I think that this is a movie that 
like I said, I agreed with you. If you don't have the royal knowledge or you don't have the historical knowledge, you might not understand what's going on. But this is a movie that I can totally lose myself in. And I absolutely love it. So I think that this is still and I love it. All right. So it's a heavy recommendation from Samantha. A tentative recommendation for me. If you see the trailer and you're blown away by it, you're going to love the movie. Mm-hmm. If you're not immediately interested in that, you're probably not going to like the movie. That's fair. So if you haven't already, why haven't you watched it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, we ruined it all for you. You anyway. listened to the whole podcast and now you know everything. But that's like a hundred year old spoiler. Like, yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> I don't think you can spoil historical drama. <laughs> Although they wouldn't be like, wait, he gets shot because that never happened. Yeah, so true. that we spoiled that at least. True. Okay. Um, well, go watch The Young Victoria if you haven't. And if you have and you agree with us, you can talk to us on social media. You can find us on Instagram or Twitter at ILTYS and the number two. You can find us on Facebook at I Love This You Should Too Dash Podcast. And you can find us on our email. You can find us on our email. That's a weird way to say that. You can email us your thoughts in long form at I Love This You Should and the number two at gmail.com. And we will see you next week when Indy lets me in on the secret of what we're watching. Oh, and from looking at when this gets released, it's my birthday almost. (gasps) Happy Emma's birthday! And we'll have one more regular pick from me that we'll talk about over the next two weeks with some picks of the week next week. Then after that, we're going to get into our Spooktober. So get ready for that. It's not so far away. We're going to do spooky stuff all through the month of October. Starting with Samantha first, and then I'll have something for you after that. And we'll be guesting on some podcasts? We'll be guesting on other things. You can, I think if you look at the hashtag all the horror, you'll see all sorts of different podcasts that are Mm. releasing things based on that horror related things. We're going to be on a couple. We're going to have some guest stars on ours, but more information when we get to Spooktober. You can definitely watch our social media for that because that'll be, we'll be tagging people that we're in and who are on our podcast. And I'm very excited for that because last year we only did kind of a quick little thing with them. And this year we're a little bit more immersed in it. Yeah. We'll let you know all about it in Spooktober. Okay. Well, we will see you next week when we discover what Indy is bringing to us now. And what we've been watching or reading or listening to over the last little while. Oh, yeah. Picks of the week. Thing of the week. Thing of the week. (laughs) Okay. Well, we'll see you next week.